Happy to yield now to uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Jim Jordan, two minutes. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized for two minutes. Uh, I thank the, uh, the ranking member. Uh, Madam Speaker, I rise today to express my opposition to uh, the so-called Employment Non-Discrimination Act. Far from actually protecting new workers, this legislation will add confusion and contradictions to Title VII's exi existing protections. We've already heard from speakers who've talked about the perceived sexual orientation language that's in this uh, this bill. Uh, Into would violate the traditional basis used to determine protected status. Those being immutable characteristic, a history of economic disenfranchisement and, and political powerness, uh, powerlessness. All of the protected classes that currently exist in Title VII meet these standards, while those individuals this legislation seeks to protect do not. The current Title VII protections are sufficient to protect our nation's citizens. Expansion would only lead to confusion and more litigation. Uh, the previous Republican speaker talked about this. He talked about the contradiction that exists between sexual rights and religious rights. Uh, if this legislation is approved, it will certainly be challenged in court and produce a clash with religious freedom and expression. And then just finally, a couple, two other things I would like to, like to address here. India, I believe, has the potential to severely hurt business. Not only will the religious exemption fail to cover non-denominational religious elementary schools, high schools, and colleges, but it may, in fact, force employers to violate their personal convictions and hire individuals that they determine may not be in the best interest of their business. Business owners with religious convictions should be free to apply those convictions to their hiring practices. And I guess I would just close by saying, most importantly in my mind, this legislation, I believe, would undermine the institution of marriage and thereby undermine that, that key institution in our culture, which I believe, in the end, ultimately determines the strength of our entire society and that being the family institution. You think about one of the reasons America is so great is because moms and dads, families sacrifice for that next generation. I believe this legislation has the real potential to undermine the importance of families in our culture, in our society, and in our country. And for those reasons, Madam Speaker, I would oppose the legislation. And I thank the gentleman for yielding. Gentleman from Ohio yields back his time. Gentleman from California. Are you two, two minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Ms. Price? Gentleman from Ohio is recognized for two minutes. Madam Speaker, Thank the gentleman for yielding. And for more than two centuries, this country has advertised itself as a land of opportunity, of capitalism and free markets, of rugged individualism, where economic success awaited anybody who is willing to play by the rules and work hard. We pride ourselves as a nation that doesn't necessarily guarantee equality in economic success, but promises equality in opportunity for all Americans. Yet today, these doors of opportunity aren't open for all Americans. Gay Americans currently hold the dubious distinction of being the only segment of our workforce that can be overtly denied an opportunity to contribute to our economy and to earn a living. Madam Speaker, corporate America has never been widely identified as a vanguard for social change. But in the case of ensuring opportunity for gay Americans, the private sector is way ahead of the federal law by leaps and bounds. At present, 90% of Americans' Fortune 500 companies have policies in place similar to what would be required under ENDA. They do it out of a sense of fairness, but also because it makes financial sense. Their bottom line is enhanced when they can attract talented and productive workers, men or women, gay or straight, that can contribute to the company's success without fear of recrimination or workplace reprisal. The ability to apply oneself, work hard, and succeed has been the American dream. This quintessential American right to pursue that dream should not be abridged, it should not be abrogated, rather it should be protected by the very government that has flourished for more than two centuries because of that dream. Madam Speaker, the concept of ENDA, the fundamental American right to earn a living, should be a principle around which everyone in this chamber, regardless of party or ideology, should be eager to embrace. I yield back. Gentlemen, whose time has expired. The gentleman from California. Happy now to uh, yield to the gentleman from Michigan, member of the committee, Representative Wahlberg, three minutes, and I would ask unanimous consent that uh, Mr. Klein be able to control the balance of our time. Without objection, the gentleman from Michigan is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you to the ranking member for the opportunity to stand uh, today in strong opposition to the ENDA 
Act. I use that uh, acronym because um, I believe it is mistitled that this is not a non-discrimination act, but rather a discrimination act, a reverse discrimination in many ways, but it certainly doesn't achieve what I think ought to be part of this society because it's a radical transformation of workplace discrimination law that stomps on the rights of private employers, adds new unfunded mandates, and opens the judicial gates to a herd of endless litigation, pitting a newly protected class of individuals based on sexual orientation against our longstanding foundation of religious liberty will force job creators to walk a legal tightrope over which law to follow and which law to violate. A business with as few as 50 employees will be slammed as new unfunded federal mandates will provide additional protections for some employees, protections that may conflict with the ability of other employees to freely express their personal and religious convictions, again, without attempt to discriminate or treat wrongly. In fact, this legislation is so poorly written and broad, it will immediately serve as another way for trial lawyers to make a quick buck at the expense of small business owners. More lawsuits against job creators in my home state of Michigan, especially with recently passed tax increases, are the last thing employers in South Central Michigan need to grow, prosper, and thrive in a competitive environment. And is a fundamental departure from the long-standing principles of religious liberty as well principles our country was founded upon. In fact, this will directly discriminate against people of traditional values and long-held faith principles. Rather than reducing discrimination, this legislation will instead reduce religious freedom and increase litigation. The founders of this great democratic republic would invariably run afoul of this legislation if they were alive today. If you want to make a stand in favor of increasing lawsuits and penalizing small business owners, at the benefit of trial lawyers, then by all means support this bill. If you want to chill the exercise of personal religious freedom, support this bill. Madam Speaker, I, for one, am choosing to stand for the basic principle of religious freedom and non-discrimination. I urge my colleagues to vote no, and I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from California. I yield one and a half minutes to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Bishop. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for one and a half minutes. Madam Chair, as one who has suffered the stigma and the painful effects of state-enforced legal discrimination based on my race for the first 20 of my 60 years, and having spent all of my professional life as an attorney and an elected official fighting to eradicate unlawful discrimination based on race, creed, color, religion, gender, age, disability, or national origin, and based on my study and understanding of the life and teachings of Jesus Christ, I cannot condone discrimination and employment based on sexual orientation. The only appropriate consideration in employment should be the willingness and the ability to perform the job. Sexual orientation, unless it adversely affects job performance, is a private matter and should not be a basis for legal discrimination, with the possible exception of the armed services and religious organizations. Accordingly, after prayerful consideration, I must therefore support H.R. 3685, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, and I urge my colleagues to do the same. From Minnesota. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm very pleased now to yield two minutes to our colleague from Texas, the former appellate judge, Mr. Gomer. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for two minutes. Thank you. My time's short. I'll get right to some of these issues. I just have a copy of the bill here. Under the definition of religious organization, it actually excludes, by definition, uh, schools, institutions that have been started by churches in which they set up their own boards because it requires that the institution has to be in whole or substantially part, uh, substantial part controlled, managed or owned or supported by the religion. So freestanding uh, educational institutions, bookstores, things like that would be opened up. Because there is so much language, I think, the, well, the Boy Scouts thought they were safe by uh, the past legislation or, or litigation, but this opens up that whole new can of worms and we can expect more uh, litigation against the Boy Scouts. Um, 
to add in some of these things like you can bring a lawsuit for discrimination if you don't like your conditions. I have one lawsuit that went nowhere because a woman claimed she was moved from working on copper to moving on uh, to working on aluminum, and that was an insult. Under this, that's a legitimate lawsuit if you have manifested, acted, or had people uh, perceive you in such a way that they think you may be homosexual. Uh, what this does is it invites people to come apply for a job, and if they feel like they may not get a job, make utterances like, well, you think I'm gay, that's why you, and they'll have a lawsuit. And I can guarantee you many lawyers will encourage their clients, uh, the employers, to pay something just to make it go away. Training programs are listed. If you don't get the seminar, then you can go in and say, you, you, you didn't give me that trip because you think I'm, I'm gay. There may be a lawsuit there. In fact, you could, and, and lawyers in some circumstances, I'd say most circumstances, will say, yeah, you ought to settle with these guys because they can take you to cleaners. There is a provision, though, here. Isn't it nice? Gentlemen's time has expired. Additional one minute. Gentlemen's recognized for one more minute. We have a provision in here that says states will not be immune under the 11th Amendment. This legislation is just going to set aside an amendment to the Constitution legislatively. My goodness, uh, that's, that's pretty bold, pretty bold. And then we get down to what the real issue may be here, attorney's fees on Section 18. You're getting attorney's fees. All the tort reform that occurred on MedMal, this will bring litigation many times over if this becomes law. But the good news for the United States is we got a provision in here. The United States will not be subject to punitive damages. Don't have a provision like that for states and for employers, so look out. What this Congress is now attempting to dictate is which religious beliefs and moral beliefs the majority believes are okay and which rich religious beliefs it feels are not okay. This will actually encourage people, whether they're gay or not, to flaunt or manifest what may be perceived to be <laughs> characterizations to help the lawyers. Gentleman from California. I give two, two, two minutes to the gentleman from Illinois. Gentleman from Illinois is recognized for two minutes. Madam Speaker, more than 40 years ago, this House stood up in the name of America and did the right thing and passed sweeping civil rights legislation to protect men and women of all races from discrimination. By widening the circle of freedom to include those who stood outside its embrace, America strengthened the character of its democracy. And that is exactly what we're doing today with this vote. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 has had a profound impact on our nation. But the work to create a more just, equal nation that began decades ago is unfinished. This morning in 30 states across this country, millions of gay and lesbian Americans went to work knowing full well that they could be fired simply because of their sexual orientation. Their job performance would have nothing to do with their being fired. In too many places, simply being gay can cost you your job. We should all be able to agree that this type of discrimination is inconsistent with American values. But for too many gay and lesbian Americans, it is a reality. This Congress has a duty to make this form of discrimination a thing of the past. We should be gratified by the fact that many American employers already do the right thing and protect the rights of their workers. Many Fortune 500 companies take this type of policies. And for those who say the private sector should be a gliding light for government, well, here's your chance to prove it. Some of the employers have failed to protect their workers, though. And so this Congress has been left with the duty to make sure our values are represented in our laws. The Employment Non-Discrimination Act offers basic protections that everyone enjoys and takes for granted except gays and lesbians. And it allows this law allows that to be true for them. But more importantly, this bill is yet another important step forward, ensuring that justice and genuine equality for every American is the law of the land. Today, I hope my colleagues will join us to pass this critical legislation and continue this country's long-running commitment to eliminate discrimination in all its forms. I yield back the remainder of my time. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm very pleased now to yield two and a half minutes to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts. Gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for two and a half minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise in opposition to uh, this end of bill. The bill, if signed into law, will have serious and long-term implications on one of our most basic and treasured institutions, marriage. Federal INDA 
will provide activist judges with the legal ammunition to move toward the legalization of same-sex marriage. In fact, state end of laws are already being used by activist judges to impose gay marriage and civil unions on the state. One example is the landmark decision by the Massachusetts Supreme Court which determined that there was, quote, no rational basis for the denial of marriage to same-sex couples. And this decision used the state end of laws in their argument. Another example took place in Vermont where the court ordered the state legislature to pass either a same-sex marriage or civil union law. Again, this state, this case referenced existing state end of legislation. Another example is the New Jersey Supreme Court, which gave the state legislature six months to either pass a same-sex marriage law or civil union law, and the court cited New Jersey end of laws in defense of this ruling. Although ENDA is bad legislation on its face, more importantly, it is just one component of a larger strategy. An editorial in an activist publication recently compared this approach to building a house. It explains that hate crimes legislation is the foundation, ENDA is one of the walls, civil unions is the roof structure, and marriage is the shingles. The author says, states, quote, when all the various above issues have been resolved, think of all the money that would be freed up to focus on marriage. We can lobby the president and Congress on repealing DOMA while targeting the weakest states to repeal their one man, one woman amendments, end quote. The strategy as laid out above is clear. INDA is merely a building block for efforts to overturn traditional marriage laws and to impose same-sex marriage on states. I urge you to protect traditional marriage and oppose H.R. 3685. Now yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from California. Yeah, I just say, Madam Chair, it's, it's a rather interesting set of remarks, except it has nothing to do with the underlying legislation uh, that was before us today. I, I yield for purposes of the unanimous consent the gentleman from New York. I, I, I uh, ask uh, unanimous consent to uh, put in the record my strong support for this bill, and I urge my colleagues to help make history today by taking this important step forward. Thank Without you. Without objection. And I yield one minute to the gentleman, Mr. Ellison. The gentleman from Minnesota is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, uh, today is a very proud day for me. I'm proud to be an American today because when this end of bill passes, what we'll be doing is affirming traditional values, traditional values like tolerance, traditional values like minding your own business, traditional values like allowing fellow Americans to rise to the full measure of their ability, traditional values, Madam Speaker, values that have made this country endure and pass the test of time, opportunity, traditional values is what this end of bill is all about. This bill has nothing to do with the institution of marriage. This bill is about giving opportunity to fellow Americans so that we can reap the full benefit, the talent, the creativity, this hardworking uh, ethic of both gay and lesbian and all Americans, all. So this bill today makes me proud to be an American and makes me very, very happy to vote for it. And I do hope all of our members do. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gentlemen from Minnesota. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm very pleased now to yield four minutes to the Republican whip, the distinguished gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Blunt. The gentleman from Missouri is recognized for four minutes. I thank the chair. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, I'm in opposition to the bill. It goes without saying that the authors of our nation's founding document understood better than most that freedom to practice one re one's religion represented one of the most fundamental, most inalienable rights uh, bestowed on us. It was, after all, the reason uh, that many came to America, uh, the reason that many fought to found America, and the founders made sure to include the free exercise of religion among the first rights they included in the Constitution. But while the founders saw the Constitution as a means of ensuring religious freedom uh, and that that be protected at all levels, uh, this bill, innocently en enough named, the, non the Employment Non-Discrimination Act would actually have the effect of rolling back these protections depending on where you happen to work. Perhaps even worse, it deliberately sets out to create a constitutional conflict between one's right to religious freedom and another's right to sue you for practicing it. Uh, the tension this bill could create uh, is not difficult to foresee in practice. For instance, uh, if you chose to keep a Bible at your workstation, or perhaps even display in your cubicle a verse 
you found particularly meaningful, the legal question uh, is simple, created by this legislation. Uh, can one or more of your co-workers, seeing that passage, seeing that Bible, understanding there are passages there about homosexuality, uh, bring suit against you and your employer on the grounds that mere presence of religious uh, symbols constitutes a, quote, hostile workplace in which they're then forced to work. The answer, it seems to me, depends more on, on uh, where you work uh, than whether or not uh, the position on your desk is, uh, of the Bible is offensive. Uh, employees, for, ans for example, at Southwest Baptist University, where I was a president before I came to Congress, would be exempt from the standards of this measure because they have a relationship with a specific denomination. But employees of either a Christian bookstore or a Muslim bookstore uh, would be granted no such dispensation, potentially being forced to choose between upholding the faith traditions uh, which they're based in which they require customers and complying with a law that says the free exercise of religion can be abrogated by a whim of Congress, uh, this is the wrong decision for us to expect them to make. We're told, however, that any of the legal questions here will be decided and settled in court. The very reason the Constitution established uh, this exercise of religion as the first of all the amendments uh, is so these issues would not have to be settled by co in court. There's really no reason here to create a new protected class. Uh, this bill puts in this newly protected freedom, it puts it on a collision course with the oldest of all the protected freedoms, the freedom of religion. The inevitable upshot of pitting two classes of people against each other, uh, one protected by the Constitution, the other by Congress, is litigation and lots of it. Uh, we can't, we don't need to create more reasons for litigation in the country. We don't need to create differences from court jurisdiction to court jurisdiction. Uh, we need to go back and look at this issue again. We need to defeat this bill today. Uh, I urge my colleagues to vote no. Uh, I yield back.